Good evening. We're coming to you from the National Museum of American Jewish History to talk about the disturbing world of anti-Semitism. And we do want to tell you right off the top here, we'll be using symbols of hate for learning purposes tonight. You may have heard of the term anti-Semitism, but do you really know what it means? Do you know how to recognize it? It all starts with education. Jew hatred at its core, uh, Jew hatred, hatred against Israel, also the country. Unfortunately, it has reared its ugly head in a number of ways over the years. It always comes down to an idea that Jews are to blame for somebody else's problems. In 2019, the Anti-Defamation League recorded 2,107 anti-Semitic incidents in the United States. That's six incidents per day. It is the highest number since the ADL established the audit 41 years ago. And whether that's vandalism, harassment on the street, even assault, and we've seen some very deadly assaults. 2019 was a deadly, deadly year, as was 2018 because of Tree of Life. People seem to be emboldened. Even though we're seeing the attitudes go down in the survey, we're seeing the acts rise up, and that's concerning. According to the ADL's audit, the states with the highest numbers include New Jersey and Pennsylvania. You're seeing it in the big counties, Philly, Montgomery County, Delco. Some of it is probably lack of education. If things are not truly talked about in the real way and real education, and you hear things and you just repeat it, it becomes fact. What are the old myths in the new era? What's interesting about anti-Semitism, often uh, with the different isms, people are looking down. You know, we're better than. With anti-Semitism, it's both a looking down and sometimes a looking up too. Right? The Jews control the money. The Jews control the media. The Jews are too powerful. Jews will not replace us! So it kind of goes both ways, and that's, that's very hard to combat. And perhaps one of the most serious myths of all, that the Holocaust didn't happen. To deny that it happened, I think, such a seminal part of our history, it feels just like another attack. It led to wiping out families and generations of Jews. term never forget really resonates and means a lot. We really mean never forget. The concentration camps still sit at Dachau and at Auschwitz and at all the places throughout Europe where the Jews perished, all six million Jews. So how do we take the oldest and most vicious forms of hate and prevent future acts of violence? Maybe it's as simple as speaking up. When we stay silent, we can be complicit. It takes work. It's time and effort and commitment and resources, and that's the way that we defeat hate. To look to the future, we must learn from the past. A new study reveals nearly two-thirds of younger Americans do not know six million Jews were killed in the Holocaust. We talked to two survivors living in the Philadelphia area. Next. Let's start with the past. The first historical event that comes to mind, of course, is the Holocaust. Between 1939 and 1945, the Nazis killed six million Jews. In fact, this year marks 75 years since the liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau, the largest of the concentration camps and extermination centers. We sat down with two survivors just to remind us all we must never forget. Michael Herskovitz is 92 years old. It's an age that sounds like a miracle, considering his story. He grew up in a small village in Czechoslovakia, where he lived with his parents and four siblings. One day, German soldiers began showing up in the town and came to Michael's family store. They grabbed my father, took him behind the building, and beat him up. And then came out a rule that every Jewish person must wear a star. Nazis forced Jews to wear yellow Jewish stars on their clothing at all times to publicly identify and isolate them. But that's not all. Michael and all Jewish children were expelled from school. In the spring of 1943, German soldiers arrived at Michael's home. Till one early Saturday morning, 
They knocked at the door. And my mom was brave, brave. She didn't care. The soldiers instructed Michael's family to pack in pillowcases quickly. The two German soldiers guided us to a, next to a railroad station. There was a field fenced around with fence, and we went in there. They called it the ghetto. The ghettos were a critical step in the Nazi process of separating the Jews. They were vacant neighborhoods with deplorable conditions used to round up Jews and force them to work before taking them to concentration camps. They packed us into the train. We had enough room to sit down, but not enough room to lay down. Again, nobody knew anything, so nobody said anything. The train rolled day and night, and the next morning, it arrived at its destination. The destination was Auschwitz-Birkenau. When the two sliding doors opened up, that's all you heard. Dog barking, gunshot, kids crying, growing up screaming. Located in Poland, Auschwitz-Birkenau consisted of three camps, including a killing center. They pushed us off from the train, and right there they separated. Ladies, men, kids, and everything. The handicapped, the old people, the handicapped went totally to the right. Because their mother stepped down from the train with a child, they walked up to her and they wanted to take the child away. I had a three-year-old brother, but my mom from the farm, she was strong, she was holding on to the child, he didn't let her to go. Michael's mother and three-year-old brother went to the right to the Birkenau Extermination Center. He never saw them again. Michael went to the left. In all the commotion, he lost sight of his father. So I've never seen my father anymore from that minute on. Survival was dependent on strength and luck. After months at Auschwitz, Michael and many other Jews were taken to a different camp so the Nazis could bring in more Jews. Michael arrived at Mauthausen and immediately noticed the thick black smoke. The crematorium was a gas chamber which people went in. The doors were closed, and after a half an hour, 45 minutes, there were no one screaming, howling. They walked in, and the, there was like a roller. They put the dead bodies on it and automatically went to the crematorium. The crematorium, the ashes came out in the bed, and the farmers were waiting for the ashes. So they all took the ashes, fertilized their field. Michael was moved again, this time deeper into Poland, to Gunkirchen, a death camp in a deep, dark forest. Conditions were so poor, and everyone was covered in lice starved and losing hope. Michael barely felt like a person anymore. Until one Friday afternoon in May of 1945, when Michael heard gunshots and his life changed again. We start walking towards the gate because the gate opened up and the guard left. Michael spent two years in the camps. Three of his siblings survived. His parents and baby brother were murdered. At just 15 years old, he weighed only 70 pounds. He did not have any hair. He did not have any teeth, but he was free. Years later, Michael met Ernie Gross, a fellow survivor. And while their backgrounds are similar, their stories are much different. Ernie was born in Romania, where he lived with his parents, five brothers, and two sisters. So when I wake up Sunday morning, I was helping my mother to put the bread in the oven, and all of a sudden they knock on the door. I open the door, and there's two Hungarian police. Ernie and his family were taken to the synagogue, where they remained for three days. And then they were taken to a ghetto. But eventually we wind up in our streets. Everybody has to face Mengele. And he made the decision that day who should live and who should die. Ernie's life was now in the hands of Joseph Mengele, also known as the Angel of Death, 
the Nazi doctor infamous for performing human experiments on Jewish prisoners. Seconds before Ernie's fate was determined, someone took notice. We saw uh, prisoners, Jewish prisoners, who were working in the camp. But one of them had, had an eye on me, couldn't figure out why. So when nobody saw him, he came over to me. He says, how old are you? I said, I'm 15. When you face Mengele, you better say you're 17. Because if you're 15, you're going to go where your parents went. I said, where did my parents go? That prisoner told Ernie that his parents went to the left. I said, what happens when you go to the left? He said, you see the two buildings? They're going to go into the first building. They're going to tell them to take off their clothes because they're going to take a shower. Instead of shower, gas came. Then he tells me to look up in the sky. He says, you see how dark the smoke is? This is because of the people who got burned and the sun cannot get through it. That's exactly what's going to happen to you parents in, in four hours. The prisoner's advice saved Ernie's life once it was his turn to face Mengele. He asked me in German, we out bist du? It means how old are you? I was so scared, I said, 17 also told me to go to the right. They were then given numbers. Many prisoners had those numbers tattooed on their arms. My number was 71,366. By that time, I lost everything, and I even lost my name. Ernie and other prisoners were forced on a death march from Poland to Germany to Dachau concentration camp. Now, instead of being scared, I'm going to go into the conservatorium. I was actually happy because I know I can't take it no more. But on April 25th, 1945, a stroke of fate. And then a, a miracle happened. The soldier near me is throwing down his weapon. Nobody moved. No, nobody knew what to do. But I turned around and I saw there's an American jeep. These four soldiers, they liberated us. Ernie was taken to a rehabilitation center for several weeks. Two of Ernie's siblings survived. His parents and five other siblings were murdered in the camps. Ernie lost so much. So did Michael. But since the Holocaust, they both moved to the Philadelphia area and built successful careers and loving families. Why were they spared? Maybe it was fate. Or maybe it was something else. What can I tell you? I was lucky and I'm happy. That's all I can say. We examine the past, now let's take a look at the present. Jewish and black communities have an intertwined history, especially when it comes to the fight for civil rights. I sat down with two leaders to discuss the conflict and cooperation. I sat down with Steven Rosenberg, Chief Operating Officer of the Jewish Federation of Greater Philadelphia, and Bishop J. Lewis Felton of Mount Airy Church of God in Christ. In the short time they've worked together, they've become fast friends, teaching each other things along the way. How would you recognize anti-Semitism is happening? What are some ways to know? First, I would say, you know, get to know other people, right? There's too much hate in this world right now. And for what reason? Why, how are you helping yourself by hating somebody else? Really understand who they are, where they come from, what their history is. And again, not just the Jewish people, but any person. The more you get to know people, you'll see that facts tell the story, not what you heard from somebody else, from your friend in school. Bishop, um, I want to ask you, um, does anti-Semitism come up? Do you talk about it in your church at all? Yes, we do. Uh, 
You know, Steve and I are children of the diaspora. He's a part of the Jewish diaspora. I'm a part of the African diaspora. We are part of a community of pain. And uh, pain has a way of speaking out to you, calling your name in a way that nothing else does. And so I don't believe that that kind of pain was felt in the same way that it impacted me because I didn't hear anybody scream. I heard nobody cry out. And are you referring to the black community then or just the community in general? Well, I, whatever you want to call it, but uh, you know, I feel that if you are a person of conscience, especially within a leadership role of the community of faith, some things ought to make you speak out. No, if I cannot take responsibility for someone else's actions, then what kind of leader am I? These are two groups of people that have both gone through slavery, the Jews in Egypt, uh, unfortunately the black community in our own country of America. We have both been oppressed. We're both hated by the Ku Klux Klan. This is not, these are two groups that must work together, must reach out, must be together. So why do you think it seems to be a little more difficult. I, again, I keep going back to uh, lack of education, lack of understanding. Look, Jews, for the most part, look white. You know, we, the Jewish Federation, just conducted a population study. It took us two years to do this. This is Jews in Philadelphia, the greater Philadelphia region. One of the most eye-opening statistics was that 10% of Jews in Philadelphia identify as Jews of color. Yeah, the history goes back uh, throughout our trajectory here in the United States of America. So abolitionist movement, uh, founding NAACP. Uh, we've had support uh, from our Jewish community all along. Well, both of you, hearing both of you talk about these connections and, and talking about how the communities have worked together in the past, is it surprising to you then in 2020 that I think some would say it's not really that way right now? Really nothing surprises me, but I will say that the, the venom that goes on particularly between some people in the Jewish community and some people in the black community, does shock me. Yes, that shocks me that anyone who would be a person of faith who can be silent, that's why you had a Holocaust. So talking is one thing, people watch and say, okay, we got it, we're supposed to be talking, but we all know it takes more than talk. Any other steps? You have to take small steps. There's a quote over the bishop's left shoulder. It says, the most tragic problem is silence. So if we all continue to be silent and sit home and just stay on Zoom calls, nothing's going to happen. You have to take action. Do you feel or do you think there's also more room for the Jewish community to be open and speak more about the issues facing the black community? None of us have done enough or will ever have done enough. This is a lifelong journey. We are all one people. We are really all one race. We all bleed red blood. And so that means your problem is my problem. Your issue is my issue. Your hunger is my hunger. And so if that is what we practice in the name of love, it makes the world a better place for all of us. We've examined the past and the present still ahead. We hear from a local youth group creating hope for future generations. Now a look to the future. Local youth organizations are committed to keeping Judaism alive. I think it's uh, a misconception that uh, young Jews like myself are not interested in religion. The big difference, I think, is that we don't really seek to celebrate and practice our Judaism in the traditional structures. We want to, you know, follow all these commandments uh, in a modern sense, that we, we want to be good people, we want to help the world around us, and uh, we're not content with how it is. Who bless the ones before us? Still ahead. A prayer for peace. To make our lives a blessing. Well, thank you for being with us this evening. If you want to learn more about anti Semitism and the Holocaust, go to our website, fox29.com, and click on Seen on TV.
And now we'll leave you with a prayer of healing from Orami Synagogue in Lafayette Hill. 